Our next presenter is Erin Miller. Erin uh, is a PhD candidate in environmental studies at York University, specializing in human-animal relations and environmental communication. She has also worked as an ed education specialist for over a decade at the Toronto Wildlife Center and is the author of a manual for NGO educators on resolving human wildlife conflicts. Welcome, Erin. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be building a bit on Natalie's talk and some of the questions that were just raised in the question period. I'm probably just raising more questions and not actually answering any of them. Um, the theme of my talk is the unintended consequences of wildlife design. But I'm not going to talk about specific consequences of specific designs. Um, and rather, I want to explore complications in general to the notion of inviting wildlife into the city as a whole which is integral to the various related approaches that we've heard um, about already today. Urban rewilding, um, uh, biophilic cities, habitature. And they're all a little different, but I'm just going to stick with the general term living cities as kind of a goal that, um, that these approaches share. So uh, when Jennifer Rolsch wrote the essay Zoopolis, which is 20 years ago now, she called for a new kind of theory, uh, urban theory and planning that could, quote, renaturalize cities and invite the animals back in, and in the process re-enchant the city. Now, she knew, of course, that a lot of animals already live in the city, um, but she, like many who have written in Spain since, felt that the inviting was the important part, um, when what we're striving for is the spirit of inclusion. Uh, where we see cities as multi-species habitats, not places where animals are sort of just eking out a living in the shadows. Um, and I'm on board with this sentiment, for sure, but one of the ironies that we already sort of talked about a bit today in, with the Living Cities movement is that you find that the people working on the ground to help wild animals uh, in the city and to foster harmonious relationships as best they can between urban people and urban animals, um, organizations like TWC, spend a lot of time explaining to people how to repel and exclude wildlife, not invite them. Um, and if you look at books like HSUS's Wild Neighbors, which is a great book, and TWC's manual about helping people in wildlife, you'll find they contain quite a bit of advice on how to make human and animal spaces, at least at the level of uh, buildings and properties, distinct in cases of conflict. So these directives to deter or even harass animals uh, are given in the interest of promoting life and harmony between humans and other species. The difference here is is partially a macro-micro one. We have one perspective that's aspirational, dealing with the kind of futures we want to build, and the other dealing with harm reduction in the reality that we have. Um, and they're both necessary, in my opinion. Um, part of what I want to talk about today is how we reconcile the nitty-gritty of living with wildlife while we're working toward change. So one assumption that I see embedded in some of the projects about inviting animals in is that Bringing them into view through design is one way of legitimizing their presence in urban space. That in the long run, these kind of physical changes to the environment will engender, if not positive feelings toward animals, and at least a sense of mutuality. Um, Mark Feldman suggests that work, well, it works like Fritz Haig's Animal Estates, which built um, vis visible habitat structures of animals that used to live in New York City into the New York Cityscape, um, work to insinuate non-human life into our everyday urban lives. Jonathan Metzger calls these types of work apparatuses of affectation, which I like. So this piece, uh, some of you may know, is by Una Chaguri and Marina Zirkow. It's called Zoopolis. It's inspired by Jennifer Wolch's Zoopolis. I really like it, and I have written about it in the past as a way to challenge more limiting kinds of formal ethical proposals for living with wildlife. But I also thought when I first looked at it that this is the way that a lot of people are currently experiencing life in Toronto. <laughs> Um, which is the raccoon capital of the world, if you want to adopt a favorite media phrase as of late. So here's what they say about this piece. Zoopolis wants to speak back to what Robert Michael Pyle has called the extinction of experience in modern life, the sad diminishing of opportunities to be in the presence of, to feel, to touch, observe, smell, and think about forms of life that lie beyond the compass of human utility and instrumentalization. This thinning of experience is dangerous not only to the diversity-reliant environment, but also to humanity, feeding a deadly cycle of increasing homogeneity and anthropocentric cocooning. From an institutional perspective, though, as you can see from Natalie's talk, masses of people in cities like Toronto are having encounters with wild animals every day, and they still don't think that they belong here. Um, some people are oblivious to other forms of life, but many are not. And some are not because those insinuating habitats are showing up in their roofs or their cars or the courtyards. 
Um, so for those who have positive or neutral experiences with urban wildlife, I think that public space interventions um, showing that animals are here are important and um, meaningful. But for those who have negative encounters, they could well be counterproductive. Um, challenging human privacy in the short run at least, at least creates an emotional fallout that's absorbed by an assemblage of organizations uh, like TWC that I think are underrepresented as a part of the necessary infrastructure of living cities and the living cities movement. But I'll come back to this point later. I want to discuss a little bit now about the challenges of designing interventions that meet uh, both the needs of humans and animals. And then I'll discuss what elements I think we need to be able to move back and forth between visions for the futures and future in our everyday encounters. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves when we talk about meeting the needs of multiple species, of course, is who the designs are for. One of the elements we see, we've already talked about a bit today, some green city approaches, or those that are about promoting non-human life, but not specifically animals, is an argument based on uh, underlying human imperative. We need living cities because it's good for us, it provides ecosystem services, it improves our physical and our mental health. Um, but there are difficulties too. One is fundamental question that has underpinned dividing factions in animal advocacy and environmentalism and conservation as well. Uh, for a long time, which is can we get to the appreciation of the inherent value of animals by way of appealing to an instrumental value. Um, ultimately, we don't know if seeing animals as valuable to our well-being is a gateway to going to see them as co-actors or subjects in the project of city-making, if that is the goal. Um, another difficulty is that when we look specifically at animals and not to capital N nature, we don't really know what kind of contact is beneficial or desirable. Most people want certain kinds of animals in their landscape, but not necessarily in their kitchens. Um, and finally, these types of instrumental arguments will always mean they're animals who don't make the cut. So um, in addition to the vast literature on ecosystem services, there's now an emerging literature on ecosystem disservices, which have been defined as functions or properties of ecosystems that cause negative effects on human well-being or that are perceived as harmful, unpleasant, or unwanted. They cover a very wide range, but some of the examples from a recent analysis are, uh, include fear of carnivores, species looking ugly, bird excrement on buildings, cats or dogs making unpleasant noises, and, um, and, and unpleasant ex previous experiences with nature. I mention these to highlight that you know, scientization or economic rationalization of our desire for wildlife can also go the other way toward having to defend an animal's presence in a quantum. So this is a question that the TWC hotline gets a lot, is what is this animal doing in the city? Why is it here? What good does it do? And if it doesn't do any good, why isn't the government removing it? Um, one answer is that urban species are important parts of urban ecosystems, but with these successful uh, synanthropes or pest species, these animals that thrive in human habitats, this can be harder to establish. But their biological carrying capacity in the city, the number sustained by food and shelter, we all know is enormous. Um, and from an ecological perspective, it's unlikely that we need as many pigeons, for example, as we have. So then we have to deal with what biologists call an animal's cultural carrying capacity, which is basically our human feeling about how many is too many, um, which is, of course, volatile and notoriously fickle. It is possible, of course, to consider the needs of humans beyond an instrumental value perspective. We might argue that we're designing to meet a deeper emotional or spiritual need to be close to non-human life, um, and it's important to foster those connections and still make a commitment to consider the needs of other species. Um, that, uh, so, uh, Bill McKibben says, Habitecture is inspired by our needs because, quote, wild animals and plants don't need to live among us as much as we need to live among them. Of course, we know that many species can and do benefit from living amongst us, but uh, whether they have an emotional need for proximity to us is highly suspect, and in most cases it appears to be the opposite. So when we design for biophilia, our own desire for proximity to them, we might not always be designing in favor of animals themselves. Um, when I worked on TWC's hotline, sometimes the most dreaded calls would be the ones that were the person would leave a message saying, I'm a real animal lover, you gotta call me back, and we go, this is gonna be terrible. Um, <laughs> Because you'd find situations like orphan squirrels that are raised on you know, a diet of completely nuts, crippled by metabolic bone disease, or um, pet raccoons that had bit someone and now had to be euthanized. 
or adult songbirds with infected compound fractures that were being kept in a box while people waited for them to like, learn how to fly. So, I mean, our, our love for animals can be quite devastating to them sometimes. And feeding is, of course, what we've just talked about, one way that we often see people trying to help urban wildlife. And this comes from a positive place, but there are some problems we'll already discussed with feeding wildlife for the animals themselves. Um, one is that it can, in some cases, uh, increase risk of disease. Um, this is a house finch with conjunctivitis up there in the upper left corner, which is something we see a lot with them, finches feeding at the same bird feeder. And for vulnerable species, I think cats and bird feeders are already mentioned, but it um, increases their risk of predation. It can also make animals sick if they depend predominantly on non-nutritious sources for food. More prominently, some types of feeding habituate animals to human presence. In many cases, even giving the feeders evidence that their behavior is directly linked to potential harm for that animal, like the animal's kind of friendly and therefore vulnerable to other people that might want to harm it, um, doesn't stop them from continuing to feed. So in some ways, it kind of presents as a type of addiction. Um, this is just to illustrate that there are elements of biophilia that are disadvantageous and harmful to animals. And yet it is in the interests of, or in the framework of promoting interspecies connection, um, an important human interest to consider. So then how do we find the balance? This is one attempt, and this is a pigeon loft in, in the Netherlands, but they've been built in other places, a retake on the old design of dove cuts. Um, so these are erected as a way to redirect uh, pigeons away from nest locations and, and building wedges or balconies where people don't want them to nest, um, and that's a way to reduce conflict with people and provide them with another nesting spot. The nests are maintained by volunteers, and the birds are attracted to the loss by a feeding program. In some cases, the feeding is done by members of the public in designated feeding areas while they're simultaneously discouraged from feeding elsewhere. So this is an interesting approach because it takes the need to feed into account and attempts to sort of streamline it through having a focal feeding point. And it does what many habitature interventions attempt to do by creating a formal, visible animal space. Um, so it's promising, though some potential complications are that this is designed as part of the pigeon control program. So when birds nest here, their eggs are removed or replaced with fake eggs. So we then have a situation where a population control program is being maintained by the very people who most wish to promote life in that species. So that could be a conflict. And some might argue whether the animal's interests are being fully considered here too. But it does work, in my opinion, um, on some levels in, trying, in terms of trying to reconcile the needs of some divergent groups. But what happens then when we move out of the territory or into the territory of individual interests based on particular uh, conflict? How do we sort out our allegiances there? Natalie already mentioned green roofs. Um, many times the only conflict here is that the goose parents are not able to get their babies down safely. Um, but other times, in the case of rooftop gardens in particular, uh, the environment has been designed as a green amenity for the residents that live there and the geese make it impossible for them to use it. If you've ever been around a nesting goose, you know that they're not very keen on people coming near their nests. So if the geese are unwanted, you additionally have a situation where they're not seen as part of that green space, but competitive users of this little patch of nature. So how do we make decisions about whose interests need considering in this scenario? Who's a resource, and who's a pest, and who's a subject, and who's making that call? So these are challenging questions. Um, that I can't answer. <laughs> but uh, catching a goose family on a rooftop is very, very stressful for them. Um, and it isn't always a total success. Sometimes animals get injured in the process, sometimes they get separated, and sometimes uh, nobody gets there in time or nobody's available. Um, in general, organizations like TWC would recommend where possible that uh, you know once the geese have been removed from this situation that you might want to do something to the habitat to try and deter them from nesting there in future years, because they often are uh, site loyal, and they'll come back and try to build nest there again. Um, so uh, the Diane Mitchell-Felder, who's an ethicist, argues that valuing wildlife in cities should be based on a community ethic. There are members of our urban community, and as such, we ought not to deceive them, move them, or eliminate them from the places where they made their home. So are these the sorts of things that we should consider in cases like this? Um, here, we'd most likely decide that the interests of the goose in not having to go through the traumatic removal process again would uh, be more important than their desire to be nest on the rooftop in future years. But the fact that the resources to continue to translocate these geese in future years aren't necessarily there, unless there's a private company that the building can hire, 
plays into the equation too. In the end, these decisions tend to come down to a balance of human interests, animal welfare, and resources available. But these decisions are nobody's responsibility, so there's a lot of inconsistency. Most of these common conflict of human and animal interests, or human and human, or animal and animal, um, are happening outside the bounds of any kind of formal wildlife management. If we want to connect this balancing act to a broader vision of multi-species living, some coordination is required. Uh, so this brings me back to my earlier point about the infrastructure of living cities. Balancing interests is the work of designers and planners, but it's also the work of those people who are helping to resolve, or often just as Natalie said, just interpret encounters with wildlife in our daily lives. So there's two points that I want to stress. Um, one is that we can't, do, and I think many people already feel this way in the room, but we can't approach design for wildlife as though the city were a blank slate, a place that we can now open up for the business of considering on human life. The urban wild is already happening, non-human life is visible, um, and it's already part of our daily experience and it's shaping urban wildlife ecologies in a lot of significant ways. A large part of managing urban wildlife and our relations with them is happening at the sub-governmental level. On one hand, we have human residents themselves, some of whom kill wildlife, but they also separate them from their young, they relocate them, they feed them, deter them, encourage them, block them from food sources, collect them, expose them to disease, let their bad cats outside. And then we have organizations with businesses who remove wildlife and NGOs involved in wildlife rescue, rehabilitation, advocacy, lobbying, and habitat restoration. So when you look at this complex assemblage that has evolved, it becomes clear that one of the common services that many of them provide, either purposely or unwittingly, is a contextualized response to particular wildlife encounters four types of encounters that happen in Toronto. And I think there's a deep need for this because the way that we experience wildlife is so different and has so much to do with what we bring to those encounters. We know through a lot of existing research on urban animals and urban wildlife values that people don't necessarily equate them, particularly the common ones, with the capital and nature. Um, sometimes they see them as neighbors or as misfits or as liminal animals or as rivals, pests or pets, and we need responses that are sensitive to that. The second and related point is that this perpetual balance of human-animal interests means that um, we need those listeners, responders, and negotiators built into the infrastructure of living cities. Um, I don't think we can separate this part from the design and planning process. What we have now is this group of sort of ad hoc interpreters that are trying to listen to humans and listen to animals and negotiate ways forward, but they're locked in crisis mode because they're often um, not considered this conference accepted as part of the wider project of build, building living cities. When we look at books like to, uh, Tim Beatley's book on biophilic cities, he lists the necessary institutional infra infrastructure as places like zoological parks, learning farms, and places that care organizations that can facilitate access to nature. Um, and I think these are important, but they don't go a long way in helping people navigate their everyday encounters, many of which are very negative and fraught with complications. Um, and these are encounters that will only increase as we embark on new forms of habitature. So our listeners, our negotiators, are a critical part of this infrastructure. I don't think that I'm wrong to say that some of the underfunded organizations that are already involved in this work might bristle a little bit at the thought of, of interventions that aim to sort of bring more wildlife into into cities or into contact with people or into public view because it's going to create an emotional fallout that is going to land in their lap. Um, which isn't to say that we should, you know, that we can better predict the consequences of designs because, I mean, I think part of our interest in this is that wildlife are delightfully transgressive of our intentions for them and we don't know what's going to happen, so are people, for that matter. Um, but, uh, what I do hope to stress is that um, designing is only half the battle. It creates a, a venue and an opening for new kinds of encounters, but we need more attention to what comes after and before. Ideally, we want design not to be at the beginning, but in the middle, where um, we have the institutional infrastructure that can both inform our interventions and also help people to navigate human animal encounters in a way that's relevant to our diverse individual experience and a particular context.
I, I learned how to volunteer with the Rouge National Urban Park, mm -hmm. which is eventually, in, if they ever settled there, the federal provincial dispute will be managed by Parks Canada. Mm -hmm. So here I have an example of the embarkment of wildlife mm -hmm. with boundary effects. Right. And I, I, have, I don't think anybody, in, as far as I know, within the staff of, of the Rouge National Urban Park has paid much attention to this. It's mm -hmm. just, wow, this is a place where we all come and see wildlife in, in, in its natural setting mm -hmm. and so on. Um, in a highly domesticated park. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it, parks generally, I mean, this city has so many parks, you know, all the leaves of parks, the yeah. official policy. And use the policy of the city uh, to have parks in it. So here's another design issue. You know, what, you know, what role do parks play, both positive and negative, in creating uh, both you know, a, a, a natural habitat but also a cultural context in which people encounter interact with the mm -hmm. okay. No, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, the, the parks are. Like in a way, they're interesting because they're, they're sort of designated nature spaces in people's minds. Um, at the Wildlife Center, we get a lot of people that will find animals, say, in their, you know, they'll find a litter of baby raccoons in their garage, and they go and release them in a park because they believe that an animal will come and take care of them in the park because it's a wild space and the wild takes care of wild. Um, so th there is this notion, which is incorrect, by the way. <laughs> But I think there, there is, you know, for a lot of, a lot of people appreciate that there are these kind of vestiges of nature in the city, but they still might be the same pe people that are having conflicts in their own sort of personal space with those animals. So I think it's complicated. You know, you can have really ambivalent, most people if you have ambivalent feelings towards wildlife, in some ways we really want to encourage them to see them, but when, when they cross that threshold, then it's just becoming like when we talk about uh, wildlife as being amenities, which in real estate they are increasingly being being considered as such, but it always depends on what type of wildlife and what kind of resources you have to put some distance between you and the animal. You want to be able to see them, but not necessarily have really those kind. Sue? Thank you, Sarah. That's really interesting. Um, I'm really struck. I love what you said about it. Um, Building coming in the middle, mm -hmm. supports behind and supports after. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, that especially, which was completely new to me, the green, and I mentioned it before, but the problem with the green roofs mm -hmm. reminded me of the um, the kind of mania of modernist planning for singularity of use and purpose. Mm -hmm. So here we're going to zone for industrial, here's where the residential is going to be, here's, and this roof is going to take care of watershed, and that one's going to be. And I'm wondering if you had an ideal. Um, Kind of committee or, or of experts who would write the legislation for green roofs in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Who would be on the board? Would it be like a, a I, ornithologist? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that we we need to bring a lot of different voices into that conversation. Yeah. But um, I guess my part of the point that I'm trying to stress is that um, I would like to see there be more representation from the people that have their sort of their finger a little bit on the pulse of what the encounters are looking like in terms of both both the encounters that people are having and their emotional experiences, but then what are the resolutions that are then, uh, how do we resolve those situations, what's involved, what resources are needed. Um, so I think, we, yeah, well, when I talk about them being part of the infrastructure of living cities, I mean, first of all, that we need their voices there on those kinds of, um, in, in making those kinds of decisions, and I also mean that they need money. <laughs> Um, to be able, or, or that there needs to be other designated organizations that maybe are not them, but that are helping to make that transition. Because I think there was a point earlier, and I don't think anybody imagines that living cities would suddenly become really harmonious spaces where people in wildlife just get along. But, um, but I'm not sure we always have enough attention to well, then what's going to happen with the conflicts? Like, if we're going to have more conflicts, then how are we going to manage those conflicts um, from from a policy perspective, from an institutional perspective. Yeah. Six. <laughs> um, I think my question was about what you meant by a community ethic, because I thought that was an interesting um, relationship between uh, what, what uh, sorry, 
uh, Ramsey was mentioning um, this morning. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious what, what you mean by that and how that would play Well, that was actually a, a, so an article written by um, a philosopher. Is that the part you meant, Diane, which called it? Yeah. Yeah, she, well, she was contrasting like how do we value wildlife in the city um, with how we might value them outside of the city. So if we're talking about outside of the city, that we might um, look at kind of a, um, have like they would have aesthetic value, say, where if you kind of take Leopold's idea that when you see an animal in nature, you kind of there's the thinking like a mountain, and everything's sort of course sort of come together, and you um, have this kind of nature epiphany um, that it doesn't work like that in the city, where you sometimes can actually work the opposite way, where you see an animal like a fox on a runway, and you think it's out of place, like what's it doing here? So she was arguing that in contrast to them having you know, thinking about the aesthetic value or maybe even the ecological value of wildlife that we need to think of it more as um, as other members of the urban community. Um, and other people have suggested a similar thing where, like um, a recent article on thinking about how do we make animals into urban commoners, like us, if we talk about, if we're talking about the, the commons, and um, that we really typically have on one side the humans and on the other side, everything else, which is the commons, so all other types of life. Are human. So how do we kind of move animals onto the other side of the equation? Which does bring up the question then of like which animals would we move over? But yeah, so that's it. Just struck me as you were talking, one of the <clears throat> maybe awkward but interesting comparisons is to think about how cities treat homeless people. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which infrastructure has you know, been militarized in some cities around you know, how to be mm -hmm. treated. I just wonder in, in the Toronto context, the award of any overlaps there are in the way that those two problems have been. Do you know much about that? I don't, but I would love to know if anybody else has input on that, because I agree with you that I've seen that, see that parallel as well. Especially with those more unwanted species that we have uh, a perceived surplus. Okay, so we'll probably take one more question, and then once again, write down the questions, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I, I, and you know, when, and Suzanne will, might get to this a little bit, but the, but the contrast between urban and rural is that your chances of an interaction with a, with a wild animal in the urban is much higher mm -hmm. than it is in the rural. And I, and I, um, and, and because, because of, of our human practices, we're allowing these animals to live at higher densities that, that they would normally not be able to sustain. And, and, and I just wonder how, if the literature addresses this at all, like kind of the, the level of encounter, and, and, and then also sets up false expectations for when you're out actually, you know, away from your room. Yes. When you don't see wildlife, you're like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen a record in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, the, so it, it just, it's a paradigm that, or like a contrast to me that I yeah. think is interesting without really knowing much about the. Yeah, I know. I think it's interesting too. And I mean, well, just from, again, in my own experience, it's always been the, the, the people that, you know, we get a lot of calls on the hotline of people that encounter animals all the time, but they still are kind of surprised that they're there. You know, it's, I mean, it's interesting because we have these species like raccoons that you know do better in the city. Um, but that surprises a lot of people because they think that they, they should be they should be elsewhere, and a lot of them get relocated elsewhere for that very reason because people are actually are trying to do the right thing and think that they do better. Yeah. 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 Yeah